to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> announcements. Uh, this past Friday, October 12th, was proclaimed Mary O'Sullivan Day in the town of Orange Town. She's the 2018 honoree of the St. Patrick's Day Parade Committee that was presented by Councilor Troy and the person who took the water. Yeah, I just, I'd like to add the fact that the Mary O'Sullivan is also the, uh, the wife of the late town councilman, Neil O'Sullivan. And both Neil and Mary, through the years, have done a lot for the community, particularly the Irish American community. But to run the St. Patrick's Day Parade, that is the second largest in New York State, and arguably maybe one of the second largest in the country, and how well it operates every single year, it's not by accident, it's through a lot of hard work, and Mary O'Sullivan does a great job on that. So, I thank the town for honoring her. Other announcements, uh, we have extended the deadline for the Pearl River Downtown Revitalization slash TOD study online feedback. Uh, that will be done this Wednesday. Tomorrow is the last day to do it. So if you're on a computer, log on now. If not, get to one by tomorrow. Uh, the website, you can go on our social media and find it, but it's surveymonkey.com slash r slash Pearl River Downtown. Uh, again, end of the day, Wednesday the 17th is the last day to submit online responses. We've already had nearly 500, I believe, the last count a few days ago, online responses, in addition to the couple hundred that showed up in person and many emails and Facebook messages and stuff. So it's been great public feedback for our downtown revitalization. Moving on, October 20th is Saturday uh, from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. It will be a paper shredding event that will be run by our town clerk, Rosanna Sprager, and sponsored by the Rockland County Solid Waste Management Authority here at Orange Town Town Hall. If you show up, bring your stuff to be shredded, all your city, uh, stuff with personal information on it, and we'll take care of it. Uh, then public hearing of the, for the Town Board Workshop of November 13th at 8 p.m. for the 2019 preliminary budget is scheduled. We also have an announcement. The, uh, we've appointed, our officially started work as of yesterday, our new Economic Development and Tourism Coordinator, Greg Garvey, he's taking over our film permitting process as we speak, uh, to the great joy of Sergeant Palazzolo, who is doing a great job, but we're very glad to be relieved of those duties. So Greg, you stand up for a second, say hi to the crowd. Greg is not local yet, and maybe we'll hear, but he has experience, he works at the number two in Westchester's film and tourism office, doing film permitting, working with tourism and communications, so that job experience means he's going to hit the ground running and start recruiting more film to our town properties, especially, so we can make more money on it. Uh, that's all we have for announcements. Next is, yes. I think you should just make mention that we're not going to have a public hearing for Yeah, I'm sorry, you're right. Uh, so uh, there was a, a technical error with the announcements of publication of the public hearing that was scheduled for today. The library and fire district ones are going to be rescheduled. So if you're waiting on that, and you just got word that I'm saying it right now, I apologize. We only found out about an hour ago. Sorry, I see you in the back. Okay. Yeah, you um, but they don't want you to wait any longer, but it's going to be November 13th, same day as the regular budget hearing. We'll do it beforehand. So that is what we'll reschedule it for. Uh, and had we found out any earlier, we would have told you. Okay, to see I was close. Okay. <laughs> we owe you that. Um, okay, thank you all for all right, we have a couple presentations for us. So first, we're going to have uh, Benjamin So from Troop 2097. He has an Eagle Scout, a uh, project he's proposing, the Walkway of Heroes. You want to step up to the yep. podium and take it away. So the Walkway of Heroes is a memorial. The microphone huh? towards you. Sorry. <laughs> the Walkway of Heroes is a memorial between uh, on Independence and Leicester Drive. The memorial has over 1,400 bricks. And recently, people have come forward uh, wondering where each where the specific brick is. And in order, my plan for the pro uh, project is to create a is to catalog and create an interactive website with the date uh, with the uh, names of the men, the branch of service, the dates they served, and the special de uh, designations they had um, included. <coughs> a law, this would have the and I would catalog them and put them on wall <coughs> online in order for people to more easily find their bricks.
Robert Dell, Walkways, American Heroes. So can you step up to the podium? Uh, sorry, yep. sorry. So, sure. Robert Dell, Walkway of American Heroes Trust, and liaison from post-1615. We've interviewed this young man. We think he's, uh, his patriotic um, intentions for this are quite admirable. We're in favor of it. We're, we will aid him in any way possible. And we've already had quite a bit of initial support from the various town agencies. And I know we've always had the support of this board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before you leave, you could get with Amanda regarding a reporter who wants to talk to folks about the Walkway of Heroes and folks that were involved with the uh, whole thing back then with, with the okay, Camp well, Shanks. Like She's right here. Just if you could link up with her before you walk out, I don't want Certainly. to miss the chance. All right, great, thank, thank you. you. Um, all right, so the next presentation is from Jim Dean regarding one of our, if not the longest serving employee in the town, until recently, one of them, uh, Mr. Michael Yanazone. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Supervisor Day. I appreciate the time here tonight. And I know, thank you to board members. Uh, I know a couple of board members, Supervisor Day, uh, Councilman uh, Troy have said to me personally, well, when are you gonna do something for Mike? Uh, we have been doing things behind the scenes that a lot of people haven't seen, but I know the town would like everybody to understand what a great job Mike Yanazone has done for the town of Orangetown Highway Department specifically, all the residents of Orangetown, and actually in the fire companies also. So I'd like to ask Mike to come up just for a minute, uh, recognize that his wife Barbara is here, and his son Mike Jr., who's an Orangetown policeman, are here. Uh, a long history of Yanazone's involved with the town of Orangetown at many different levels. Um, and I brought tonight just a couple of things that Mike has already received, just so that you can have an idea of how people think about him and how much uh, we've had people from all types of uh, walks in Orangetown supporting Mike. Um, of course, I'm, I'm great that he's gonna retire and get to relax. I hate to lose him. Uh, we've been working together for a long, long time. Uh, the other part of that is I've been in the town of Orangetown Highway Department for over 60 years, and I've never worked here when there hasn't been a Yana zone that I worked with. When I first started, Mike's father and two of his uncles were working in the Highway Department. So I was the kid and they were the grown-ups. And then Mike, Mike came along, so for the last 42 years I've been working with him. So now that he's leaving, I'm really not sure. We're just finding out what it's like not to have a Yana zone. But we're working at it. Um, but there is a long history of Yana Zones involved with the town of Orangetown. So one of the things, one of the things we have presented Mike already is a picture that we have hanging in the highway department that actually shows Mike's father and his uncle and his uh, two uncles, Sam and Uncle Tony, back in 19, this one was back in 1967, just a little while after we moved into the location at uh, 303. And we put all the names of the people on the back so he could remember, we could all remember. Um, the employees got together and gave Mike a plaque, uh, awarded uh, of appreciation presented to Mike Anazone. Thank you for your dedication and outstanding leadership as the general foreman of the Orangetown Highway Department presented on behalf of the women and men of the Highway Department, October 5th, 2018. That date, because something very unusual happened, Mike's family got together and gave him a really large retirement party. The family did it. Uh, and there were over 100 people there. And it was really a family. It was like 50 people from their blood relatives and the other 50 people were all people related to the town that have worked with Mike all these years. Um, so it was, it was just, it was a magnificent event. It really was to show how many people uh, wanted to thank him for all the work that he did. Um, also at that night, he was given an award by the American Public Works Association, uh, New York Metropolitan Chapter, American Public Works Association, 
uh, that takes great pleasure in presenting Public Works Official of the Year to Michael A. Yanazone, General Foreman, Town of Orangetown, Highway Department. This is a uh, national association with a chapter that covers the Hudson Valley. And Mike has been instrumental in helping them in many, many programs and recognized as a leader. So also, because we w didn't want Mike to forget us, we also gave him a picture of the, uh, the latest picture of 2018 of the Orangetown Highway Department, a place that he's led uh, by example for all the time he's been there. And the last 20 years as a general foreman, you've seen me give him presentations for 100% attendance, never misses any time, always leadership by example. So we gave him this because we don't want him to forget us. We don't think he will because he doesn't live far from the highway department. But we also know he's getting older, so we made sure there was a list of everybody that's there. <laughs> I know he's getting older. <laughs> he's making me older. Uh, but what happens is, and I've said this before, some people have heard this, but you don't realize that when somebody works for the highway department, it's not just that person their family has to be on board because from December through March, there's no control over whether you're gonna be home or not. If you get a snowstorm, an ice storm, any kind of an emergency, our people get called, they go to work. Sometimes it's 30, 35, 40 hours before they come home. So that means nobody's home with the family. So I wanna thank Barbara for all her support and Mike and their, other, and their son Chris because it, they even made a comment about it, not knowing what we were thinking at that meeting. Now they were getting their father back. And that really, a, com a family has to com be committed, otherwise you can't do that job. So I do want to thank you guys for all that. And one last thing, we really want to thank Mike. Uh, we know he's going to be around. And we had brought something in our, this is our official highway packaging. It's a recycling bag. So when you're picking up leaves, you get your uh, bag so you can do the recycling also. But we put something together for Mike. We want him to stay warm and cozy through the winter. But we want everybody to know who he is and what he did and who he still is. So here's your jacket, Mike. All right. It's Thank fancy, you. it has our insignia, it has 42 years of service because that's, he started with us in 1976 as a CEDAR employee. Some people remember CEDAR employees. That's when the federal government gave the town uh, 10 positions to help boost the economy. Um, and he was one of our CEDAR guys that we kept when the money went away. Good for us. Thank you. Uh, it also says on there, uh, he's got four stars. And that's partly because of his 40 years and so many years of not even taking a day off, but also because we consider him our four-star general foreman. So we thank, thank you. you for that, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. And it also says Deputy Superintendent of Highways because that's what Mike is, and he's going to stay as the Deputy Superintendent of Highways. And we've already talked to the supervisor about this, and this is... I'm hoping this is just gonna continue, that he will be our deputy. So thank you, Mike, again. Uh, thank you. We appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the board wants to say something. I'm not sure if members of the board want to say something to Mike. I'll say something. <laughs> yeah, I'll Mike, say something. you want to say something? I want to say something for now. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Just, just to give me two minutes. Just, I just wanted to thank uh, the supervisor and the town board members. I want to thank the residents of the town, and I want to thank the people who I worked with, who are probably some of the toughest people when the times do get tough to work with, but the easiest people to lead. And it's been an honor and a privilege to, to work in this town, to work for this town, to work for its people, uh, for this town board and for all the previous town boards before, because I really know that you guys and the guys before you always had the town at heart and really wanted to do the right thing. So, uh, Dennis, when you said you wanted to do something for me, you did. Uh, you gave me 42 years of a life in this town. I was able to raise a family. I still live here. I'm still going to keep living here, I think. That's what my wife keeps telling me. 
Uh, so uh, uh, hopefully, but I just want to say thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege, and uh, I'll never forget. And I got to mention Jim Dean, who, um, like he said, was here over 60 years, is probably the most caring, dedicated public servant in his profession that I know and that you all know. And what a mentor, what a leader. And uh, talk about leading by example. All you got to do is follow him, and you're going you're gonna to achieve, and you're going to just rise to the top. So just thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'm going to go wear my jacket now. <laughs> For my 19 years on the town board, Mike Yanazone has been the personification of leadership. He's a man of class. He's responsible, a responsive person. When you call him up, say there's a problem. If Jimmy wasn't around, you talk to Mike, accountable. And what you could see is how he worked with the men and the respect they had for him. And the highway department has always done a great job here in this town, whether it's the fall season, the leaf pickup, or it's the snow removal, or it's the spring cleanup, or it's the paving, all right? They're out there doing a great job. And the, the good news here, I think, is that they built up a bench, you know, with the new management coming in behind Mike. The thing I always said to Jimmy Dean, I couldn't believe Jimmy Dean would stay working here and let Mike Yanazone retire. So. This is new territory for you, Jim. You're 100% correct. So, Mike, good luck in retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know I've known Mike uh, quite a few years, and, and he's not only a great person for the town, but a great person for the community. He's involved heavily with the uh, uh, Sparkdale Palisades Fire District. And you can always tell um, the people who give back to their community. Because they do the same at work in the, the same way to their fellow uh, work uh, employees, that the, the people that they work with. Um, they're caring and they're dedicated and they work hard and that's what makes this community so great. So thank you for your service for the town and for your service with the fire district. Mike, just the class act. Uh, I think the thing that I remember most about you is that you, you made the, your, your men work, your, your men respected you, they worked hard, you got the job done. And some of the other departments, I always say, well, look at what Yanazone and Jimmy do. They get it done. Uh, they, they handle things internally. They do th the things the way they're supposed to be done, and uh, it's going to be a real loss for the town that you're leaving. Good luck in retirement. Hit him straight. <laughs> Uh, Mike, I'm not going to say anything more because you, 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 uh, you certainly, you know, we, we know each other a long time. It's going. Uh, Barbara, I will say to you that uh, on Fridays, uh, he's ours, okay? We'll be playing golf on Fridays, and uh, yeah, it, the gap is only going to get larger because he's going to start hitting the ball better, all right? So enjoy your retirement, Mike. Thank you. Mike, I think everyone's said a lot of what could be said, but I will say that um, I'm glad I got to know you, of course, the last few years at community events. I wish I've had longer time to work with you in a professional capacity. I'm glad you're leaving Mike Jr. here to continue working in the town. Uh, the way you are as a human, as an employee, as a person, and a member of the community is what makes this town amazing. You personify that and what makes this country amazing. So you, you are what people should aspire to be in terms of your dedication to your family and work. And we're all honored to have known you and to continue to know you. So thank you. Okay, moving on from that to something a little drier on this side. <laughs> we have a presentation regarding the Bloomberg uh, request to install a helipad over at the data center in Orangeburg.
So good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Leckler. I'm a site planning consultant. I uh, have been working on behalf of Bloomberg Organization since 1990 on a variety of many different types of projects. And uh, it's been a long time since I've been in front of your board. I was here in the summer of 2013 to brief the, the board about the Bloomberg need to create a helicopter pad at the data center that's over on Corporate Drive. And in the intervening time, what's happened is we've been working to make sure that all of the conditions that could be addressed, should be addressed, and need to be addressed will be ironed out and solved so that we could come to you all with a clean and, and approvable project. So the first step that was required was we needed to go to FAA and talk about feasibility. And in 2015, we had FAA review and approve the location, the orientation, and all of the different elements of the helicopter pad that are necessary. Uh, then what we found out was, and th this is sort of a briefing I'm giving you because I'm going to walk you through a few graphics that explain how, how we formulated just the plan. Get a, more back the back to the mic, the yeah. Of, it's yeah. Just that you see yeah. It through, yeah. Um, so, uh, the, uh, the second step that we had to follow through on was we found out from the, uh, a planning report that there were uh, nesting bald eagles over on Lake Tapan. So subsequent to finding that out, we hired a consultant who observed and made uh, observations that went to the New York State DEC and we found out through a long process with them that they were able to approve our project not having impacts on, on any bald eagle habitat there. There was also then threatened and endangered species review for all the area around the helicopter pad and we found out that we have a clean record there. We also um, spent time pulling together agreements with neighbors about the helicopter pad and some of the conditions that the FAA has required that we, uh, that we put in place to make the helicopter pad safe. And so what we're doing is we've had agreements with neighbors about some obstruction removal. That took time to accomplish because there was changes in ownership. And now we finally reached the point where all of these things have come into place and come, have been resolved and we've put in recently to the board, uh, the planning board, the zoning board, and to your board requests for planning board approval, zoning board review, and approval of two variances, and a special permit from the board, the town board. We're here in front of the town board because the helicopter pad project, the definition in your ordinance says that any helicopter pad needs to be approved by a special permit of the town board. And it also repeats that in the zoning for, for the LIO zone district. A helicopter pad is allowed as an accessory use to a primary use, but it has to be approved under a special permit. The helicopter pad is uh, a very uh, important element for Bloomberg uh, at their data center. The data center is a very important building for their, uh, for their company, and um, it needs to operate all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it's linked into a worldwide network that disseminates information, processes information, and it has to be functional at all times. The data center is designed with redundant systems, and one of the redundant systems that we're trying to create with the helicopter pad is access. Right now, access to the helicopter pad is ground, ground transportation. We would like to create a second means of immediate access by having the helicopter pad available in the event that it's necessary. So one of the things that everyone here should know, and I must stress that's the most important aspect of the helicopter pad proposal is that if everything goes well, it won't be used. The intent of the helicopter pad is purely to be intended to be used for emergency situations. There will not be scheduled flights. There will not be uh, uh, landings that will be happening uh, in a frequent basis. The helicopter pad's intended for use when there's a need that absolutely cannot be met in another way in order to get a person 
or a piece of equipment to the data center to make sure that the data center can continue to function. And so I'll give you an example of, of how we foresee that it could be used uh, ultimately. Bloomberg has a data center that I helped them get approved in South Brunswick. It's in central New Jersey. And that helicopter, uh, that data center has been operational since 2007. So for 11 years, the helicopter pad has been there and there have been two flights. Um, those flights occurred during the Hurricane Sandy event where they needed to get some people to the data center in order to be able to keep everything operational. And like I say, two flights, a landing and a departure, a landing and a departure. That happened twice in 11 years. There was one other flight there recently. We did do a flight in order to have the helicopter come in so we could do sound measurements and create uh, a report for you folks about what uh, sound measurements result in. And you'll, you'll see that those, those meet the FAA standards for um, for residential uh, development. So we're applying the highest standard in terms of sound uh, controls. Recently, as I say, we made the submission to the Planning and Zoning Board. What the process will be is that the Planning Board needs to review, uh, accept and review the project and advance it through to uh, a point where they, they uh, declare as lead agency hopefully make a negative declaration, which they can then review the project and hopefully approve it, direct it to the zoning board, because we are seeking approval of two variances that relate to um, as follows. Your ordinance calls for any helicopter pad to be 500 feet inside the property line of the lot that it's residing within. We can't satisfy that over at the data center at, uh, on, on corporate drive. We're seeking a variance for a lesser, um, a, a lesser degree of setback because of the emer um, emergency situation use of the helicopter pad. Secondly, the ordinance calls for any building that is within 500 feet of the lot in question that any one of those buildings not be greater than 30 feet in height. We're again seeking a variance from that particular clause in the ordinance because we don't know how we could arrive at a circumstance where we would cause the and compel the neighboring owners to comply with those regulations. What we're relying upon is the FAA limitations on height. They have a very strong, strict set of regulations about height limitations along the proposed and approved flight path and to the sides of the flight path. I'll be explaining that in a minute. Um, the, uh, the flight path, well, let me take you through to a couple of these drawings and explain to you what the helicopter pad uh, alignment is to look like after I take you to an example of where we are. On this map, the you data center is located on the southern border of the town. You should to just turn the microphone towards you. It's on the southern border of the town to the east of uh, Lake Tapan. And so this is a little closer view. This is corporate drive here. The data center sits here east of Lake Tapan and the large Verizon building is right next to the, to the lake. This is a little bit closer view of the site surrounding the data center. This lot is the lot on which the data center sits. This small lot is considered parcel two of the data center site. It's on the opposite side of Corporate Drive. And right now, the only thing on there is a surface parking lot where folks park and come across the street to go to the data center. This is the Verizon lot uh, and the Verizon building. This is Lake Tapan. We have a neighboring property here, 33 Corporate Drive. This is number 30 Corporate Drive, 20 Corporate Drive, 8 Olympic Drive. And this lot is the Hunt Road site. It's a piece of property that the town owns that has a couple of decommissioned uh, facilities on it and a few other buildings there where there's some operations ongoing at this point. Um, when we went ahead to design the, the the whole prospect of the data center helipad 
it's clear to us that this location is where the data center helipad should be. The map I'll show you here indicates that this green square, and I'll have other drawings to show you, is the proper location for the, for the uh, helicopter pad relative to the data center, to the neighboring lots, and to the surrounding land uses. We have aligned the helicopter pad flight path to parallel the New York, New Jersey border because that complies with some FAA limitations and requirements on the flight path being uh, responding to prevailing breezes which are from the west. Um, what you see on this plan is bordering each of the, the flight paths to the west over Lake Tapan and to the east over this commercial zone, uh, LIO zone in the town is what's known as a 500 by 4,000 approach and departure surface. That's an FAA limitation and requirement where you have to scrutinize the height of elements in that area to see if there are any obstructions that need to be dealt with. Um, there are very few obstructions in the distant ends of the, uh, of the approach departure surfaces. The, the obstructions we're going to be dealing with are directly uh, adjacent to the helicopter pad. It constitutes pretty much it, it's because of a few, uh, a number of existing trees that need to be dealt with. What happens is when you study this, what happens is there's an eight to one plane that moves away from the helicopter pad in each direction. So for each eight feet out, one foot up, that plane ascends to a point 500 feet at each end of these uh, approach departure surfaces and anything that would violate that surface, the FAA would want us to deal with that obstruction. What has happened is we've received the FAA approval here, and uh, the FAA approval was granted in 2015, and what they, uh, I, I met personally with the FAA reviewer at the site, went over with them all the submission documents, and they found that one light pole in the parking lot has to be reduced. They found that trees on the east, on the this lot owned by 20, uh, uh, well, that's the wrong map. Uh, yeah, this map here is easiest to see it on. There are trees at, on this lot on the east edge. There are trees on the Verizon lot here and some trees on the township lot that need to be cleared in order for us to create the safe conditions that need to be put in place and to uh, satisfy the conditions of the FAA. The, um, the FAA approval uh, grants us uh, uh, time to get these approvals and it, it, there's no time li limit on working on this helicopter pad. The FAA uh, views this helicopter pad as a general aviation private use helicopter pad. Our plan is to use it in an emergency situation when and if Bloomberg needs it and to make it available to any town related need for emergency of any sort, any town related um, or, or local related medical helicopter um, landings that might be necessary for whatever reason at the local ball fields or otherwise. And thirdly, to make it um, available to the state police. When we, when and if we get our approvals cleared here in your town, I then have to submit to the State Department of Transportation to get the police, the state police to review the conditions, make sure we're not impacting any of their facilities, and they will have it in their registry as a place where they could land if there was a circumstance that they needed to. Um, what happens uh, with this data center property is there's an, another factor that came up, as I mentioned earlier, and if you look at this map in this location on the border of, or on the, on the shoreline of Lake Tapan, there's a bald eagle's nest. It was alerted, we were alerted to it by one of the planning reports for a minor site plan application at the helicopter pad, uh, at, at the data center. As I say, we've dealt with the DEC. 
We've spoken with them extensively and had surveys produced by qualified environmental threatened and endangered species consultants. And what happened was, that the, and this is in all the submission documents to all three boards, that the DEC has found that they are, we're not going to be creating a negative impact on the, on, the helicopter, uh, on the eagles because what we've decided in our operations is our, um, our group has decided we will not use the West approach in order to avoid creating any conflict with uh, a bald eagle uh, nesting and habitat. And they may end up leaving, but that's an agreement we've made with the DEC not to use this West approach so that what will happen is the impact will, won't occur. And they were able to say that under that agreement, we can go forward without look, seeking any permits or other approvals. Um, the helicopter pad, being that it's only going to be used for uh, uh, um, uh, an emergency uh, instance, we did nevertheless go ahead and create um, sound tests down at the other data center site. and. We will provide testimony with uh, uh, its uh, Lewis, good friend and associates there. Principal uh, there is a man named Matt Morello who's testified before your boards before on this data center about acoustics. And he will be providing a testimony that our helicopter, which is a twin engine, uh, I'm gonna give you the exact numbers, Leonardo A190SP Grand Helicopter, it has a 35 six foot six inch rotor, a 42 inch, uh, a 42 foot length, and um, that helicopter, when it flies, we did testing down there. It is below the FAA standards for residential areas, so it shouldn't create any nuisance uh, uh, when, in terms of sound. And in consideration of the fact that we're hoping. Quite honestly, if everything pans out well and there aren't any emergencies, that if this helicopter pan's never used, maybe nobody will ever hear anything. So I can take the board through the uh, the variances if if I was if I needed to, or if you felt it was necessary to take you through the the variance uh, uh, the specific the specific paragraphs of each. Um, Variants we're going to be seeking. Rob, do you think that's necessary at this point? I don't think so. No, no, because we, we're going to improve the concepts. The ZBA is responsible for the variances, so it's okay. And we have the document anyway. So, uh, to sort of sum up here, um, when we go ahead and we're seeking this approval, a lot of what we're going to be seeking the approval of the board on is measures to be taken in the vicinity of the helicopter pad to maximize safety. So we, we believe that we've satisfied the FAA, they've approved our project, but we do have to meet some conditions that they have for us. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the set of plans to explain to the board a few elements of what the FAA requirements call for. This is a simple cover sheet, and this is an overall plan that describes that this is the data center. Corporate drive is beneath here with the cul-de-sac that leads to Verizon. This is the lot on which the data center will be located. There's a parking lot here, uh, the helipad, I'm sorry. And what you see here is the flight path that goes east to west. That flight path is what I mentioned to you earlier that you will go up one foot for every eight feet out. On the side of the helicopter pad, you go up one foot for every two feet horizontal. So it's a steeper climb on the sides of the helicopter pad as compared to along the flight path. It's a very slow <coughs> ascent for obstruction review and studying. The helicopter pad itself is 75 feet square. It has pavement markings that are prescribed by the FAA and it will take this shape on the lot where you'll have a 75 foot square helicopter pad with the pavement markings. There will be a fence surrounding it requ as required by the town. There'll be a sidewalk leading to the helicopter pad. There's a, a wind cone that's needed or required by FAA that will be located in this area. 
And what will happen, you'll see these spots on each side of the helicopter pad edges. Those are ground level lights. They are one foot tall. They are in order to basically wash the pavement with light when there's a landing. Those lights won't be on all the time. They're actuated from the helicopter when the helicopter comes and is approaching to make a landing. When there is a landing, the helicopter will come and it will, obviously it will descend and land. The helicopter would be under normal operations, turned off after three minutes if it's going to remain. That's because they can't keep the engines going independent of the rotor and they would want the rotor off so there's no wash. Anytime there's a lift off after the helicopter has been on the helicopter pad, it would, there'd be a startup procedure for three to four minutes and then the helicopter would ascend, the lights would be turned off, and the helicopter pad would go back to its normal function, uh, being empty basically at that point. The, the other thing that needs to be mentioned about the helicopter pad is that not only are there approach departure surfaces in this, this, this 4,000 by 500 foot uh, zone that parallels the, the flight path, but at the end of the helicopter pad, on each side there's a zone called the heli helipad protection zone. The helipad protection zone is an area that the FAA wants to be clear of anything that could be in conflict with a landing or a departure, and in that respect, they've required that in this parking area, that is to the east, I'm sorry, to the east of the flight path that at the time when there's a landing, they want the cars removed from the helipad protection zone. The helipad protection zone extends 280 feet in that direction, basically the length of the helicopter, uh, of, of the parking area. When we met, met with and dealt with, with the FAA, they asked us to produce a procedure that would be orchestrated and overseen by, uh, by the Bloomberg security staff. And that procedure was submitted to FAA and is one of the conditions of our approval that those cars would have to be removed from the parking area when there's a landing. The plan is that those cars would be parked similar to what happened during construction along the curb lines of Corporate Drive for the short period that the people, that, that there would be a, a potential landing. Now, also, I mentioned to you earlier that these height limitations describe uh, uh, planes that emanate away from the helicopter pad one to eight in each direction to east and west, and one to two as you're working to the sides of the helicopter pad. That means that there are trees that need to be removed. Uh, just so I don't, I don't think we all need to necessarily know. Is this too much detail? Uh, scotch. Um, well you have, I thought you have, I'd give you everything. You gave me more, more than we expected. Okay. But it's good. You're overprepared. Better than the opposite. But you have all the FAA, FAA approvals. How many trees need to come down? I've Approximately. I don't need an exact number. Just, I've just got to get to the right sheet and zoom in a little bit and read this chart. There we are. Oh, hey, there's probably an exact number. These are numbers I don't have committed to memory. So on the site of the helicopter pad, there are 25 small trees that have already been planted that could get too big that we're going to replace with trees that can't get too big. Okay. There are 29 trees on the Verizon lot. That's to the left or to the west. There are 23 trees on the 30 corporate property, which is to the right along corporate drive or to the east. And then on the town lot, there are 63 trees that need to be removed along the north boundary of the helipad lot or the south boundary of the Hunt Road lot. Okay, so the, I think, and maybe I'll just turn over to the board after this. I think we've covered most of the, the, the key points we'll need to review, to sit the public hearing at least. Are you replacing um, all the trees? That's what I was gonna ask. So will you this be replanting? This is a proposed planting plan to replace Tree for tree. On each, each of the three lots. Okay. And there's a separate, uh, it's hard to read here, but each lot, there's a separate plant list for each. So you're replanting everything that's taken down. Okay, good. So 
to summarize, basically, you have your FAA approvals, you have your DEC approvals, you are in the ZBA and planning board processes. You um, do not have a flight path that goes over any residential areas. It goes That's over correct. the lake and the corporate area. That's um, correct. And you are in proximity to the baseball, f the, the sports fields, our Veterans Memorial Park area, providing an emergency access helipad should something happen to someone in that area. That's where there correct. There is no nearby one. The nearest one is the hospital. Um, uh, is, I uh, believe. No, the town hall. By the, town, the by the firehouse. Sorry. Right. Yeah. So. There's one right there now if this would be approved. So you're looking for the special permit. What we'll be deciding today is just whether we want to set the hearing on the special permit. So does anyone have any questions for, for, the, for uh, the presenter regarding the topic? Last time a helicopter uh, permission was come, came here, it came from uh, Pfizer. It was back, I don't know, about 15 years ago. I voted against it. I hate helicopters, freight helicopters. But I have to tell you this. That was an excellent presentation. The fact that it's emergency uh, only, it sounds all right to me. I think when I was here in 2013, you said you didn't like a helicopter pad. He doesn't like the radar. still don't. <laughs> I still don't. But we've done everything we can to mitigate the, the emergency part of it. Emergency situations is, uh, is key for, for the project. It's we more believe. about the helicopter for Dennis than the helipad. He's just got a fear. The thing with Pfizer, for me, the other part to that was the fact that it was for a uh, corporate president to come flying in here a couple of times a month. To me, that's ludicrous, yeah. you know, and that's not a reason to be flying helicopters here into Orangetown, you know, for the convenience of some uh, exec. It's not. Uh, you're talking about what you need to do here f uh, in order for emergency situations, for a key data center. We're glad Bloomberg Data Center is here in the town. And I support this. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have any other questions before we, because we're going to be just workshopping the setting of the public hearing. Rob, right. Yeah. I was just going to say the, the vote would be next week. The, we, uh, Jane and I spoke with, uh, with Mr. Loeffler and with uh, their representatives about the game plan. They're, it's going to be simultaneous next week. If the board is so inclined, we'll vote to set the public hearing for the special permit. They'll also be going to the planning board and starting the process there in terms of SECRA. So when it comes to this board, it will already have had a review, at least by the plan, a thorough review by the planning board, many of the issues that already came up. But um, so when it comes to this board, it wouldn't be till probably the end of November, I think was the date we had, the second meeting of November. And uh, by then, you know, it'll, we'll have gone through all the, everything it's gone through already in addition to the planning board and, and ZBA. Great. All right. So thank you very much for the presentation. I think we'll be moving forward, at least we'll say in the public hearing, and then we'll go from there. All right. I appreciate the time uh, to be able to present to the board. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. thank you. All right, moving on, that ends our presentations section. I do have an item that's a semi-presentation, -pre semi-discussion, announcement discussion. Um, so if you folks on the board here and in, at home or the five of you here, remember back in, I think it was the spring sometime, we hired Gold Cap Consulting on a contingent basis for finding things that could save money for the town, like subscriptions and this cell phone carrier versus that one. Uh, he's wrapping up his work this month, and what he's, the, the number he's looking at that he's found and he's implementing already, and so basically the annualized savings from these things, and it was simple stuff like he went through our cell phone, our phone contracts and got rid of numbers that we don't use, and went through our, uh, all sorts of different things like that. Uh, that it's gonna be about $24,000 a year in savings of which he'll get 50% of for two years as the compensation. But then additional, he's going to get, he got us uh, working with Anthony and Matt over in IT, uh, 18,000 approximately. We're working on the final number a year in savings for printers that he's not getting anything for because we wrote it out of his contract because we had already started that process. So he'll be getting, the original thing was 50% of the savings for two years that he delivers. He's going to actually get less than that. Uh, so we're looking at 24 plus 18, uh, you know, you do the math, but I'm elected official, not a finance guy anymore. So uh, I think it was definitely a worthwhile thing. The question then becomes the different uh, departments, some of them have come up with things that they think that he, him and his company would have been helpful with, but did not fit under the scope of the original agreement that there's no direct dollar for dollar savings for. So an example, uh, Stefan's not here right now, but the highway was looking at possibly using him to help renegotiate the contract for uh, streetlight repairs for the, the traffic signals. 
it becomes a question as to seeing a successful result here with this firm, do we want to create a uh, hourly rate capped thing that our departments can take advantage of as an efficiency consultant for the next year, something like 5,000 a year annually total, I, I think his rate's 150 an hour, so that the town departments can take advantage of it, or do we just want to say this was great, we saved this money, and we're going to call it uh, the savings to the budget. So I just wanted the thoughts there, we'll put putting it on, or not putting it on, any suggestions? For uh, and if you uh, write yourself a proposal, I'd be interested in it. Okay, all right, so would you take a look then and see if I can, Tom? Yeah, interested in, in terms it. of getting other departments to do it, it still have to be driven from the top, you. Yeah. Right, yeah, no, I know, I, it, it's, uh, but so the, the thing I'll say is that the departments, a couple have identified things they wanted him to do that he couldn't do because he was being compensated on a dollar for dollar, same thing, savings basis. So it had to be, you know, a, a cell phone contract changing the features on it and he gets the difference as long as it was the same service. So there are identified things in there. Okay, cool. And I think it's good. We, we basically didn't spend anything out of pocket and ended up saving annualized that money. It's every year going to be there. <laughs> Moving on to the agenda items. Uh, we are not doing the two public hearings as we had planned. And so that moves on to item number seven. These are voting resolutions based on timelines for certain things that either occurred already or need to occur before the next meeting. So the first section is voting resolutions before we get to the workshopping. Number seven is a resolution to approve and lend assistance to the 2018 to Pan yard sale at the Masonic Fairgrounds that happened on Saturday. Do you have a motion on that item? Councilman Troy, second from Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Great. Resolution to appoint Ken Sh Kenneth Schmidt as maintenance mechanic two in Parks and Recreation. He'll be starting, uh, today's the 14th, so he started um, replacing uh, Bobby Y. All right, motion from Councilman Valentine, second from Councilman Batari, all in favor? Aye. Great. Then uh, nine, the uh, Lend Aid Assistance, this is the fundraiser for that firefighter who lost his hands and feet in, uh, the, to that disease. Um, is there a motion on this one? Councilman Batari, second from Councilman Troy, all in favor? Aye. Great. Uh, then we have a, a, a resolution to award a bid for the Homes for Heroes Green Innovation contract uh, there was some back and forth with this. This has become time sensitive because of the grant associated with it. Um, has everyone been briefed by Jim on this, or do we want him to just give a brief summary? We're good. You're good. Okay. So, is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second from Councilman Divney. All in favor? Great. All right. So now we're moving on to the workshopping of resolutions. No voting right now. Um, we have the mobile parking payment services that's almost 100% ready. Uh, and then we'll have the free mobile payment for parking in Pearl River to the town. There'll be a fee charge if someone wants to charge pay mobily and it will not affect the rates generally for parking in Pearl River. Then we're, we have a public hearing for the HNA Palisades Premier Conference Center to open, to close, to adopt a negative declaration as for CICRA. And moving on a few more pages. Then we have number 15, which is actually to adopt the zone change, which if we choose to do so. Um, one thing that was added to this is a condition that uh, there shall be a binding upon the applicant's successor and assigns a restriction on bulk regulations, making sure the height is the same as it would be in the current zone as opposed to increased as it would be in the new zone, and making sure that the incidental convenience shops that we presented in the uh, permitted in the new zone would not be permitted at the property. So basically, we're, we'd only be giving them the hotel difference of use, theoretically. Uh, that was kind of the attempt to uh, allay the concerns for other possible uses with that. And then we'll get to that next week. Um, then we have a open the res resolution to open the public hearing for the watercourse diversion in Pearl River to close it, to approve or deny it. And then we have a resolution to set the public hearing for traffic flow adjustment in the Pearl River train station. Um, this, and we've worked with uh, both uh, town attorney and highway on this. The concept here is that we're gonna set a public hearing to get input from both the New Jersey Transit, importantly, 
and from the public as well for making the space that would be between Bronsdorf Park and the, uh, the train station a one-way out from the parking lot onto Central Avenue to increase pedestrian safety and thereby also create a um, space on the far side by the train station to have a taxi stand. And Anthony, if you could pull up the, the could you get the screen for that map, the, 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 for the, the pro parking map, the proposed one? Was that, were you ready to do that or? Matt's, Matt's on it, okay, just have it ready. So we're good. It's, it, we have a few things that tie in together in this meeting for those who are following along. There's a Pearl River downtown parking map, the one way of this street, the electric vehicle station placement, all, and, the, and, and in, if in the parking lap, it's gonna be setting of 30 minute parking zones that is a new zone. Uh, those are all tying in in separate distinct things that have to be done to get it all done. So 19 is the public hearing related to the one way portion. Then 20 would be to the declaration for SECRA for that. 21, in that case, the public hearing would be on the 13th of November, thank you. And then the 21 is to set the pub Bloomberg helipad for the 27th of November. 22 is to set a resolution to set a public hearing for noise code amendments. We're looking to amend the noise code to allow for more scientific analysis of the sound levels as well as to pr prevent the uh, construction noise and lawn mowers that were not covered by the current sound code uh, during certain hours. So we, don't, we have a more modern version of the noise code. Uh, the version that is in the backup is not the final version. It'll be ready for this coming Tuesday, but it's very similar to what we'll have. Yes. That's where taxis would theoretically have to go instead of stacking up on the side there where they do so, right now. I mean, is that the only place they can uh, loiter, hang out in town or in, in, in Pearl River? No, no. The intent of that, and we'd have to, I, I assume we'd have to delineate it by a sign, is that anyone in that lot for the train station would have to be in that thing and not just taking up a random spot inside the lot or sitting where they, right now a lot of times they're around the curve on Bronsdorf where there isn't any spots. They just sit there kind of blocking traffic this would kind of funnel them into one specific space if they're at the train station. Uh, so they're more safely stacked up. And then people going to the taxis aren't darting across the parking lot and everything. How many spots do you need? The idea would be, I think it's four or five, whatever the distance is that covered by the, I think it's five spots across the street. So it'd be five, the equivalent, yeah, it's, it's the distance of five. Um, you might, since we're talking about it, we might as well cover the parking map now and we can skip it when we get there. So on the screen and in your hands, we have the current map followed by a proposed draft new par parking map. In January, we approved a 30 minute zone for uh, a new zone for Pearl River to be able to use for parking. It was never placed anywhere, but the intent at the time was to put it in the vicinity of Maine and Franklin. So in this potential draft, we have it overlaid over what were, if you go back and forth, a, a few two hour and a few 15 minutes in the area between Ridge and South Main on Franklin, just off Ridge, and on South Main at the corner of Franklin, all become half hour. And then along with this, so we can get the full map adopted, the last time this was adopted was in 2010. So this is kind of bringing it up to date. We are adding the taxi stand concept here, which would go along with the one way, because now we have the space for it, to get the taxis out of the regular part of the lot. And two of the five spots along there on the Bronzdorf Park side would become EV spots, which under our current thing that we're looking at would still permit non-EV vehicles to park in. They just have to pay the 25 cents an hour, but it, two of them would also be EV, st EV spots. So this adopts all those things in one format to put on the website where this current one is currently on the website um, for the town, for people to look at when they wanna know where to park. Um, so what are your thoughts? I mean, this is not, again, we're not voting on this today. What are your thoughts on the map both in terms of the 30 minute placements, the taxi stand, anything, including where other things are. I mean, we don't have to keep, say, you know, the strip in, on Central to be 11 two hour spots. It could be changed to whatever. We're adopting the entire map as a whole so we can do a holistic look at it. What are the penalties for uh, not complying with using the taxi stand? Because if you're going to say park here, because I look at that tax, that area all the time at my office, unless you have someone enforcing that. Well, I think that, first of all, the question would be, Rob, is there, is this something we would have to add a regulation to include it in the parking enforcement? I guess, yeah. I mean, 
Because that's the only way it's going to happen. And it's yeah. got to be, yeah. it's got to be substantial. Yeah, I mean, having the space is good because it's not there now. I think they would instinctively want to, but you're right. There has to be an enforcement mechanism as well when we, otherwise it's not really, it's just a suggestion. Right, and I think it could fit under the parking regs, but, you know, the issue is I think if you, if you provide it, that, that, that's really the, the feeling, right? If you provide it, that they have a They need a place have to a be, spot. and they if, don't have a place if anything, to be. If, <laughs> they're there. It's just where they're going. If, it's if anything, it's, than it is now, it's, the, it's the people who aren't in taxis who are going to, you That's know, what I'm more worried about, using it as a loading zone than a taxi zone. Because the taxis right now park around that where it wraps around most of the time, and sometimes in those five spots. They'll go closer to the train station if we give them a place to. And now that it's, it'll be one way, it's safer to do that. It's just, will other people use it too? We'll, you know, I guess we just have to try to enforce it with the signage and the, and the traffic authority, the, the, the parking authority. I guess, and the other issue is what is the, what's the fine if you're in the taxi? Well, that's, yeah, do, with the current fines and stuff in the parking section, theoretically, part is we have to amend the code to add a taxi stand to it. I think we need to add, I don't think we have anything on taxi stands, so no. we would have to add, you know, this is a sp spot specifically for that, but. Um, so theoretically, we could create a code change that would go along with the. It would have to be the no, no standing. Yeah, no standing in a taxi zone or parking except for taxis. So we, well, that get, I mean, do you want only taxis there, or can it, or somebody could picking be, somebody I mean, up from the, the station? Question, do we want it to be only we taxis, or do we want it to be a loading, offloading, slash taxi zone? Uh, no, I, it's, a, it's up to us. We're deciding, so. If, if, well, here's the deal. If I'm, a, if I'm a taxi cab driver, and you're going to allow regular people to go in, and you're not gonna be I'm not going to park there. Right. So it'll be taken up. That's a valid point. Okay. So, Rob, would you suggest that we in the course of this workshop he's deciding that we may want to set a public hearing on changes to the, the parking code to allow us to do the part the taxi stand with enforcement yeah we could put that on next week for a for resolution okay to so vote to set a hearing we can set a hearing for the same day as the one way and do it in succession because these are all kind of moving balls that, on the same topic um, if we don't do one we can't do the other or we could but you know it's, it makes sense to do it together all right so let's if we could get that together to vote for next week to set a public hearing on the taxi stand, incorporating it into our parking code enforcement, our parking enforcement, that way we have the rules along with actually designating it. What about the map's location for the 30-minute zones? What does everyone think right now about that? This is not subject. To, see, this map's not subject to public hearing. We're just going to ask for people to ask public comment, so we really have to make sure we're good with it. i got to look at it. There's not a lot of changes. It's not. Mo the only changes really are the taxi stand, the two EV spots, and then this corner and then of the brown. brown this yeah, which is where the guy who was yeah. wanting it has been there for two years. It's right. Really those two are the changes in the taxi stand. It's so you got a couple spots on main. Th See, these become half hour. Five That's on. in front of the uh, antique store. Yep, and in front of. Uh, you got five on Franklin, and you've got two on main, five on Franklin are what's turning into 30 minutes. Yeah. Essentially, the corner of Main and Franklin, corner of. So you're turning two 15 minutes into 30s and four. No, that's one, really two, turn into 30s. one, two, three, four, five. It's seven total. So five, five two hours are becoming 30s and two 15s are becoming 30s. So you're expanding on two and you're decreasing on five. Which is the. Uh, where's these ones right here? That's. That, ten, that one right there? Yeah. That was one, that, that one you're pointing to with the corner of Ridge and Franklin was one two hour and one 15 minute. So that's in front of that little hill. Yeah, he's not gonna want that. Silver. He'll want everything 15 minutes. Yeah. He's not gonna he's be getting it. Get we're we're kind of yeah. training him a, a two hour and a 15 for two 30s. I don't know if he'd rather have a two hour and a 15 or have two separate 30s. It decreases one of the spots to give it a little more turnover. What kind of trading it? I don't know. We could just make it the two hour be a 30 and make keep the 15. 15. We could do that too. Well, the other guy wanted 15 still and he didn't get it. This guy, that's what he wanted. 15 for his little, uh, what do you call it? His little antique store. Yes, in front of the antique store is the three that would, the three between right. Main and Ridge. Well, we don't decide that. Yeah. Okay. I think, we're, I mean, we're close to where we're going to probably end up being, but any other thoughts you might have on other stuff on the map, too? We'll try to have them ready for the next meeting before we vote. 
but this right now, I guess, is good enough to keep un unedited going into the next meeting, unless you guys want to send something after the fact. Jared, do you have anything you wanted to go into? Any, any changes you want to incorporate now, or just reorienting to the map? Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So that's the Pearl River parking map. Um, then... So we're not technically on that part on the agenda yet, but since we got there, uh, that was the noise, noise code. We're on 24, which is the authorization of funding for the Pro River Chamber of Commerce holiday lights. Bless you. And then 25, uh, this is related to accepting grants from DASNY for digital scanning equipment and for traffic signal at Central and Williams. Um, and then 26, we just discussed, which is the parking zone for Pro River. Uh, the language technically hasn't been put in yet, but we have the map to reference. 27, uh, this is the specific resolution for the location of the EV charging spots. The ones in Spark Hill, and it's in the backup, have a detail. It's the two northern, northwestern spots at Depot Square. And the ones in Pearl River, it's the two southwestern most in the row of five between the parking lot, uh, between the Bronsdorf and the train station on the Bronsdorf Park side. Um, and moving on to 28 is what the rules that we've kind of bandied about, which is they'll all have a two hour limit. They can be used by either electric vehicles or non-electric vehicles as long as they comply with the limit. The charge for anyone to use, to charge their vehicle, the cost per kilowatt hour will be 15 cents. Uh, that's in keeping with most other areas when they charge by the kilowatt hour. We, ch we pay about five cents per kilowatt hour. In fact, we're re we do a resolution on it right now and usually there's a slight upcharge to give us some money for any upkeep. These will be under warranty for a few years and we'll be able to pay them to extend that service warranty. Um, and then, the, yes. I'm sorry, let me see if I can. Across from the taxi stand. Uh, yeah. Across from the taxi stand. Why is this not skipping? Yep. I think it's going yeah, draft new here. If you look. Uh, no, I thought it was across from the taxi stand. I'll do a laser. There we go. All right, so the taxi stand here. This is, the ta this is the train tracks, right? Yeah. This is Bronsdorf Park yeah. with the laser. This is the new taxi stand, that light blue strip. Yeah. These are were five spots that were two-hour parking spots. The bottom two of the five will be now two-hour EV spots. It's green because EV is green, and it made sense. Um, I figured it was an easy way to remember it. And again, we're going to have anyone, we don't know how good the user is going to be. All we know is that the people that build them tell us the more visible, the better. But if someone who is not EV, since we don't know how much is going to use, wants to park there right now, they'll be able to. But in Pearl River, they'll have to pay the 25 cents per hour that they'd have to pay in another parking spot anyway. They wouldn't be paying to charge their car, obviously, just to do the 25 cents an hour. In Spark Hill or anywhere else that we were to theoretically do this, they would not be charged the 25 cents per hour because no one else is charged to park generally. They'd only be charged to charge their vehicles. Then they get to pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour for the charging. So in the Pro River Parking District, they're charged the same amount they get paid. They get charged anyway. Outside of it, they're charged the same amount they get charged anyway. Uh, Chris, yes. Uh, the electricity supply is 5 cents. But we're also charged delivery charges by one hour. Okay. 10 cents, so okay, so we're going to want to make it more like 20 cents to 25 cents a kilowatt hour. See that we we were just going over the resolution that we had in here, so that's only supply. So if we could for the draft going to the next one, change fifteen cents to twenty five cents per kilowatt hour, and move on. Next on town board IT, this is a resolution setting a digital management and digitization effort for the town. Um, Anthony's available if you want to discuss it, but basically it sets a timeline for starting digitization of all processes and records that can be digitized. So going forward, it sets a timeline for uh, inter uh, interoperability and what, what, what should be included when you look for these digitization and these softwares. And then also sets a timeline for backwards digitization of records that we have on hand already. So basically the first step is not adding to the stack of paper. The next step is making sure all processes are now in software format and we have a software that allows to do that. And the final step and the most expensive one eventually would be digitizing everything that we have on hand. Uh, that's a five year timeline for that one. One thing Anthony found when he looked at it 
uh, apparently in 2003, it we were supposed to start doing online building permits, <laughs> and it's now 2018, and we haven't. So hopefully by having a resolution and setting a goal and a timeline, we'll be able to move all in that direction and, and increase efficiency, which will allow us to operate better for the residents. You really don't, you really don't need a resolution. No, you don't need but, one. But the fact of the matter is if the resolution ensures that this gets done, that's a very positive thing, but exactly. you really don't need a resolution. No, no, it's not. So essentially, it's, a, it's effectively a memorializing resolution, but it states that everyone's on board and we're setting this goal together as a team. It's a good one, though. Thank you. I wrote it myself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, next one, the uh, lease agreement for the copier, there's still some blanks in here, but uh, Anthony, you want to talk to that real quick, because I don't think we're 100% on what it's going to end up being, but it is a savings. Yeah, so we're, we're a little late just kind of getting that going. Um, our current copier contract is a five-year agreement ending in December. Um, this new copier agreement that uh, you had said before that um, Walter Goldman helped us with, um, we've kind of been going back and forth for some time now, uh, but we finally were able to finalize it. Um, Walter kind of helping us push it over the, over the, the finish line with just some things that we don't have the ability or the time to kind of negotiate with three vendors on. Um, but basically we're 4,000 a month right now on our copiers, 16 copiers townwide. Um, we'll be going to 17 copiers, adding another copier for the inspectors at the building department. And we're going to be down to 3,000, at least 3,000, just depending on um, the wide format scanner. The wide format scanner is included in that 3,000 a month, but I believe that's going to be purchased with a grant. Yes. Which is going to bring us down to about 25, 2,600 all in a month, which is getting us to that, um, that number of almost 18,000 a year savings over the five years. So 18,000 a year. So um, that's, that's pretty much the gist of that. We're just going to have the final language, and I, and I got it to... Um, Rob a little bit late, and I appreciate him not being upset with us, but um, he, he, he seems very uh, okay with it, at least. Not over um, the finish line yet. Yeah, so we'll just, next week, <laughs> we'll just have some final language to get done, and we'll, and we'll get that squared away. Okay, great. Thank Should you, I stay? Anthony. Thanks. That's all I think we need on that one. There's sure. another one, though. Oh, there's another one right after, right? The municity, yeah. So this one is the software. I'll do the, the high level and then ask anyone any questions. The high, this is the software that basically will replace, would theoretically, if we buy it, replace um, all the stuff that is paid for in fire, to, fire prevention and building, and also then do other stuff beyond that. The cost per year is slightly less than the cost of the software we pay for, but there is an upfront cost of, it comes to 91,200 minus the 11.7, that would be the first year's annual maintenance cost. This software has been through this and, a, and I think we went through five or six other types of softwares, has been through every department, every, multiple tests for interoperability, for efficiency. I went and looked at it myself. This is gonna allow someone to do online building permits. It's gonna allow one department to see what the other one's doing if they need to. It's gonna immediately digitize everything and, and save thousands and thousands of personnel hours that we spend on paper products and on the current systems which are outdated. Um, I want. Anthony to be able to answer or add anything I missed and also answer any questions that there might be. So did no, I miss the, anything key? No, the, so we have IPS right now. That's our billing department software. And that, that did the job that we needed to do. I mean, before that, we had a DOS-based program for the billing department. So in 2011, when we had IPS, it, it did the job. But now as the billing department is maturing with Jane coming on and having some new ideas, um, we need something bigger and better. And the board has talked about it. We've all talked about um, online permitting. It's, it's long overdue, and this is going to be something essential that Municity will, will allow us to do. Um, there's also a, a lot of other integrations, GIS integrations, directly into the building department software. Um, there's also um, uh, integrations directly with the assessor's office. So there's no more, you know, kind of going back and forth figuring out who's what as far as assessment goes. Uh, one thing, C Councilman Batari, the question about the violations with the police department. Since it's a web-based software, we just give permissions and, and rights to the, to the correct person. They can look up violations immediately. I mean, right now it's jumping through hoops. I mean, we've tried to work it out, but there's just no way to do it. But vi sharing violations with departments, things like that would be so much easier. And also it's, it has asset tracking, so you can 
overlay that for the highway and for DME. Um, it, it's got some task management as well. Uh, it, it does, and it, honestly, like from the user standpoint, if I'm, a, I can, I would be able to figure it out without training. Yes. It's not, it's, it's, it's modern. It's not like a complicated system. But we have to be okay with the, the purchase of it, essentially. Yep. And uh, and one last minute thing, we Matt and I were at uh, Laserfish training today. Laserfish is the document management software. Um, and I talked with General Code, who is the provider of Laserfish, who's also the provider of Municity. Um, we need to expand Laserfish. That's part of it. That'll be part of that previous um, uh, resolution that you had spoke about before. If we are able to do both Municity and the expansion of Laserfish, they will give us a 7.5% reduction on both. So that's something that we may want to be able to talk about. They need, you know, there's obviously a timeline for it, but I can show you the numbers and we can see if we want to move forward with that. Laserfish is more the document retention and processing side of things, but the same company does all these things and they work together. That company does most of the training? Yes, they do it all, yeah. And then on an ongoing basis, would you then be doing the training? Matt and I, yes. Okay, just checking. Yep. Thank Matt, you, Anthony. Really. Anything else no, about the uh, municity? No. All right, great. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, thank you. All right, a few easy ones left, and then we'll be all set. We got the motion to, or the resolution to accept documents to the town clerk's office. We have an indemnification hold harmless for, um, yes. If I could jump in on that one, uh, I mean, being told that uh, we'd like to vote on this one tonight. It's just uh, accepting a hold harmless agreement. Um, oh, this one's 33. Yeah, 33, with respect to- it's time um, sensitive. A, an item, did you want it or no? Yeah, with respect to an item. Um, I think it's self-explanatory in there. The, the homeowner has a, uh, a berm uh, and uh, in order to, it's in the right of way in order to leave it, they have to sign a hold harmless agreement, which they have done. It's and already there. We, yeah, right, we've looked at it. So. Right. There's no really no change. We've looked at it, and uh, it's going to be filed in the county clerk's office. So uh, we want to get that done sooner rather than later. So okay. if we could vote on that. Someone tonight. want to move that one? Okay. Councilman Valentine, second from Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. All right. Moving on. Uh, resolution to approve certificate of sewer registration. That's non-voting. Then we have a lit tort settlement. Um, is this? This is finalized at 30, or is this just uh, what you yeah, want authorized? Yeah, That's yeah, final at 30. Okay. Um, reclassification based on a um, desk audit for a clerk in building department, and then for appointing her to that new position in reclassification. Then resolution to award the bid for electricity supply, which that's the point, the, the four is 0 0.6 cents per hour just for the supply. And then we have budget adjustments for the current budget, the 2018 one, the one we're in right now, not for the one that's proposed going forward. This is to bring us more in line with reality is the way things are spent, essentially. So Jeff, if you want to explain. Yeah. Yeah, when we put it into the uh, agenda, it kind of got all jumbled, so I gave you that copy, which is a little clear. You know, essentially everything that we're doing here is we're adjusting lines that are over or under budget, which is what the comptroller asked us to do periodically throughout the year. Uh, the major change in here is obviously the unbudgeted uh, uh, raises for all the contracts. Uh, so if you look at uh, the A fund, you'll see the total appropriated fund balance went from 700,000 to 4.2 million. That was actually the defeasement of the bond uh, completely. So. Uh, the rest of that was just between different budget lines and there was no real uh, increase in fund balance. In the B.16, which is the police, uh, you see you know, significant increases in the uh, permanent staff, time and a half. That's all due to the uh, contracted raises. Uh, the appropriated fund balance increased 472,000. Uh, so less than the contracted raises would imply, but still a big hit. In the D fund, uh, similar situation, you had appropriate fund balance increase 500,000, all due to the raises um, and, um, you know, not being budgeted for. Uh, then if you look in the sewer fund, you had a total increase of 278,000 in appropriated fund balance. So all total, uh, you're looking at about 1.2 million 
uh, increase in appropriated fund balance, uh, which is actually less than just the raises were alone. And as you uh, all know, for 2019, the raises were 2.3 million. For uh, 2018, the impact of the raises was something along the lines of 1.4 million. So uh, absent the raises, we're $200,000 under budget uh, as we sit right now. Okay. Any questions for Jeff on the budget adjustments for 2018? Okay, thank you, Jeff. Police, we received a grant for uh, $300,000 to assist with addressing opioid issues and uh, intervene. Uh, this is from the federal government, so we'll be accepting that grant, and it's gonna be administered uh, in part with our police department and by our finance department as well. Then we have appointing uh, Christine Banta to a new position, uh, senior records clerk, uh, well, not new position, uh, filling a position that existed. Then appointing Elena Walker as a parking enforcement aide part-time. Then a approve uh, lend assistance for uh, share Christmas in Brownsdorf. Then Justice Court to authorize submission of a grant application. Then Parks and Rec to accept a memorial bench in Tapan Memorial Park. Then another assistance, but of a different type for the lend Christmas or the share Christmas uh, event. Then Highway has one which is interesting. We have to formally clarify and correct the name of a street. It should be Elwyn Street, not Elwyn Avenue, but it's now Elwyn Avenue. So we'll fix that. Where am I, do I have it backwards? Yeah, it should be. Should be Elwyn Street. Should be Elwyn Street, but it's currently referred to as Elwyn Avenue in some documents. So we're gonna make sure it's clear that it's Elwyn Street. We can't do anything about the L1 part. Proposed resolution to adopt, uh, approve and adopt a road uh, for Mountain View Avenue. That'll be done by Senator Carlucci. Then approve uh, proposed resolution to grant permission for John Wintersteiger to attend some training for $300 for Demi. And to approve a tax radiori, I don't know why this is a Demi, but uh, for Dicant America, uh, we're getting hit with 18,000 school districts getting hit with 102,000 counties getting hit with 5,700. That's all I have. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to discuss for the workshop? No? Okay. Uh, we have two folks that we uh, want to adjourn in memory of. Uh, did anyone specifically put this on the agenda that they would like to speak to? If not, I'll summarize. Okay. So we have Dr. Teresa D'Antonio Crum of Tapan. She was former secretary for the town of Orangetown for 35 years, an active member of the National Guard. She retired with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And Dolores A. Yoakum, a former resident of Pearl River, an RN. She worked at the Dominican Convent, Dominican Sisters of Sparkle, New York until 1989. Uh, two of them passed recently and want to adjourn in honor of them. Is there a motion to adjourn in memory of, of those two ladies? Councilman Divney, second from Councilman Batari, all in favor? Great, thank you very much.